Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. This is Wednesday. So the program on Wednesdays we call Wisdom Wednesday because we are studying the book of Proverbs each Wednesday. And we've already worked our way up through almost the end of chapter 17. And we're going to pick up today where we left off last time. And we'll begin with chapter 17, verse 25. Uh, if you have not seen the previous uh, uh, episodes, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope we will go back and watch those. Uh, but at any point you start reading the book of Proverbs, uh, I, it's going to be a great benefit to you anyway. Uh, with me today, I have Brother Eric. I want you to introduce yourself. Say hi to everybody before we get started. Hello, everyone. It's me again, the homo. D-E-H-A-L-L-M-O, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, please subscribe to Brother Eric's channel on YouTube. He, his channel is D-E-H-A-L-L-M-O. All right, uh, beginning now, I, I'm a what uh, Joe Byron coined as a KJV firstist. I, I like to look at the KJV first, and then oftentimes uh, uh, I will look at another translation if I find it maybe helpful to understand it better. So let's start off KJV chapter 17, verse 25. A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. Well, that verse stands alone. Uh, the next next verse uh, changes the topic a little bit. So let's talk about that. We 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 spoke about this a little bit last time, but uh, could you imagine having a foolish son that's always doing foolish things, always getting into trouble because of the bad decisions? How how the father and the mother would would feel about that? Oh, absolutely, uh, but Luke. I've seen it with my own eyes. Thankfully, uh, my own children uh, don't fall into that category. They come off close to it, though. Okay. Well, I don't want to come off like I'm bragging all the time about my son, but I'm very, very proud of him. And uh, he, he's very wise, way beyond his years. He's 35 now. And so uh, I, I've... Uh, had a lot of friends in my life that have had real big problems with their children. Um, they become drug addicts or criminals and they go to jail or they're always in some kind of trouble and making bad decisions. And, and I, I always felt so much sympathy for the parents. Uh, I, I think, and if you're not a parent, maybe you can't understand this yet, but for your children, to, to suffer in some way by doing foolish things and having to go to jail or getting in accidents because they're reckless and 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 uh, being injured and uh, or especially the loss of a child the most tragic thing is for a child to die before their parents I think and when those things happen uh, it, it just it is so hard on the parents uh, the thing I one of the things that I pray for every day is is for my sons to to be blessed with safety and health and uh, prosperity and happiness and and he he has all those things so I'm I'm just thank you Jesus for that but I really I have seen so many of my friends I have some of my good friends that they have wonderful children no issues at all but before I retired from work uh, the place I worked. Uh, a lot of the employees I knew there, it just seemed like every day they're just heartbroken because of their the problems with their children. Uh, we'll go on, brother. I'll let you say the last word on that, though. Well, oh, thank you very much, brother Luke. Uh, my heart goes out to them, and uh, I offer to those folks the good news of Jesus Christ, because that's the only cure and solution for everything that ails us and uh, that's about the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ 
who died for our sins according to scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures to mend our broken families and to heal our souls to give us new life in Christ Jesus and we will talk much about that later on okay all right brother Let, let's go to the next verse it's uh, uh verse 26 also to punish the just is not good nor to strike princes for equity well i understand the first half of that verse also to punish the just is not good i mean someone who's innocent should not be punished uh that's that's what happened to jesus uh he was innocent and he was punished in our place but he did it willingly and it was a it was the greatest act of love in the in the history of the world so in that case uh, the just was punished uh but normally when we see people who are innocent or if you if you're innocent you know i i i know in my life I can give a couple of examples. I won't, I won't go into any detail, but there have been a couple of times where um, I, I was completely innocent and falsely accused of something. And it's a, it's a horrible situation to be in. Um, fortunately, uh, I was never punished because I, I, was always, I was exonerated when the truth came out. But uh, could you imagine, brother, being uh, innocent, uh, being a just person, and, and then be, being punished for something? Oh, absolutely, Brother Luke. It's one of the great blessings that has befallen me myself because every time it's happened to me, God has turned what Satan meant for evil to good. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I don't understand the second half of that verse. Uh, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified. Um, it says, nor to, to strike the noble for their uprightness. Um, in the KJV, it says, nor to strike princes for equity. Uh, and in the Amplified, it phrases it, uh, nor to strike the noble for their uprightness. Uh, I guess um, uh, and when I see it in the Amplified, it seems to be making the same point as the first half of the verse. Uh, is, does that seem right to you? Uh, well, to be honest with you, the second half is a great mystery to me. Uh, but it does seem to strike a similar tone to the first half. All right, we'll move on now to the next verse then. Uh, KJV. Um, Proverbs chapter 17 verse 27 he that hath knowledge spareth his words and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit he that hath knowledge spareth his words um, spareth his words um, I, I think that means that uh, if a person doesn't need to be talking all the time, spouting off and, and, and trying to like in a boastful way uh, say things to, to uh, uh, demonstrate how much they know, like, like you know, the term a know-it-all. Uh, I think that's what it's referring to. Um, what do you think, brother? Well, there's no doubt about that, Brother Luke. That's exactly what it's talking about. <laughs> I've uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, I've seen that happen over the years with street preachers and at, when I first started street preaching I also uh, violated in that way too I uh, see the, the, the message for salvation the good news the gospel is a real simple message and uh, for a person to hear that message and understand it, they don't have to understand all of theology. They don't under, have to understand the Bible from, from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, they don't have to know the answers to 100 theological questions. 
They just need to know that Jesus is offering the eternal life as a free gift if they'll put their faith in him. And, and it's a simple message, but in evangelism, if you are street preaching or even on YouTube, if you're making a message in evangelism every day, um, it's, it's a job that is repetitious. And it, it could get to be monotonous if you didn't love it so much. You know, I, it doesn't get monotonous to me because the message never loses its, its power and my, I never lose the joy of, of sharing the good news. But what ha I've noticed is that some people I observed street preaching, uh, they would start expounding too much about theology as a whole uh, and, and going into all kinds of theological things that were not even pertinent to, to salvation. And in those cases, what I thought the person was doing was um, violating what it says here in this verse. Uh, let me look at it again. It says, uh, he that hath knowledge spareth his words. Well, see, they have all this biblical knowledge, and instead of sparing their words, instead of holding back and saying they don't need to hear all that, they go ahead and want to tell them everything, and it's all for ego. Because, and and I, as I said, I, I confess, I, I was guilty. When I first started street preaching, brother, um, I remember the very first time I went out there, um, I felt so inept and incompetent. I was embarrassed, and I thought, uh, I thought no, I, if I'm going to do this, I want to give my best for Jesus. I don't want to do, come, go out there and do some, uh, like, a, you know, a horrible job of, spreading the gospel. So I, I ended up preparing a message. And what I did was um, I wrote it out and it was 20, 30 pages typewritten. And to read the whole thing, just to read it, it would take 90 minutes to read it. And I ended up memorizing it, a 90 minute speech or sermon, word for word. Uh, now that was, I actually surprised myself that I could actually memorize such a lengthy thing word for word. Um, and that's, and then I started preaching it. But eventually I, I realized that, wait a second, um, they don't need to know all this stuff. What, and it's particularly what, what showed me what my error was that a lot of times people are just passing by. If you look at some of my street preaching videos, you'll see that people are passing by. And, and really, you might only have like a 30-second window of opportunity as they're approaching and they get near you and then they go past you. And in 30 seconds, I said, they're not hearing, the, these same people are not hearing this 90-minute message, you know. They're only getting 30 seconds of it. So I better learn to condense this down to 30 seconds. Tell them, what do they really need to know that, that I can tell them in 30 seconds? And that's how my street evangelism kind of evolved and, 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 and uh, I, I learned from my mistake. But in hindsight, I think I was guilty of pride. I think I was out there. I knew so much about theology and I told them all this stuff. They didn't need to know it. And what other motive could I have had except like boasting, showing off that, look how much I know. And so I did learn my lesson, but I think I, I, I was guilty of that. Over to you, brother. Well, brother Luke, I'd be lying if I ever told you I wasn't proud. So I, I'm guilty of that as well. But thanks be to God, his mercies are new every morning. And this is the fellowship of the mystery. We come together in fellowship in Christ and receive his forgiveness and his, uh, his love and his freedom every day and health and well-being. We come together and we fellowship every day with, with that. Um, 
Okay, brother, I'm going to go unplug my telephone. I keep on getting these phone calls. Uh, uh, to elaborate a little bit more on that, that that verse if you can, and I'll be back in like 30 seconds. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Luke. As you know, today is Wednesday, and uh, every day of the week, there's a new thunder. And today's thunder is uh, right here. Well, no. It's where did it go? Uh, it's Romans 1 16, actually. It's for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Jew. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, brother. Uh, so now the the first half of that verse says, He that hath knowledge spareth his word. So you know, just because we know a lot, and, and, and this this applies not just to theology and, and to evangelism, but it applies to life in general that, uh, hey, do you have to, like, show off all the knowledge you have about something? Sometimes it's it's best to just, uh, uh, you know, tell people a little bit if, 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 you know, whatever the subject is, uh, you know, the subject always does not always have to be about yourself, you know. There was a, a famous uh, rich man many, many years ago. I think his name was Andrew Carnegie. Uh, and, and he was famous for being uh, um, a conversationalist. And he was at a banquet and this, uh, a, a woman was able to talk to him and visit with him at the banquet. And then afterwards, uh, she said, it's true, he, he is the best conversationalist I've ever met in my life. And, and uh, then he, he was asked about his conversation with a woman, uh, you know, why she would say such a thing. And he says, well, all I did was ask her about herself. <laughs> all he did was ask her questions about herself. And that just shows you people love to talk about themselves. Uh, so sometimes it's best to just wait and, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to immediately start telling everybody all about ourselves and our lives and our accomplishments and our knowledge. And it really comes off as egotistical, self-centered. Why not just wait until someone starts asking you some questions about yourself and then, and then tell them, you know, answer their questions. But I think that's a, a good application for this verse. And then the second half of it says, a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Brother, what does that mean? Well, Brother Luke, uh, that seems quite obvious to me. Uh, a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Pretty cut and dry, if you ask me. <laughs> Like it, but I'm going to look at it in the Amplify and, and see how they phrase it. It says that uh, a man of understanding and wisdom has a cool spirit, self-control, and even temper. Yeah. Well, um, uh, hopefully, as we study uh, Proverbs, uh, it, it's, it's teaching us how to, how to be wise. And, and, and there, there's a, probably a hundred ideas that are offered to us. Uh, they're saying, if you learn this principle, you'll be wiser. And if you learn this principle, you'll be wiser. And as we learn them and apply them to our lives, we get wiser and wiser. This is another example of something that's wise. And uh, if, if you have wisdom, if you have knowledge and understanding, it says here that you, you will have... Um, and the Amplified says, you have a cool spirit with self-control and an even temper. Do you have that, brother? Does that apply to you, you think? Absolutely not, Brother Luke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm going to tell the audience that uh, your answer uh, actually re reveals that you, you, do, you do have it. And you have a, you have already so much of what we're learning from 
the book of Proverbs. You already have it. And in that case, you're certainly are not boasting about it. You're being humble. And that's one of the other principles that we need to learn from the book of Proverbs is humility instead of being proud. So I gave you an, off, an opportunity to kind of brag about yourself and say, yes, I'm all that. And you said, no, no, no. You were very humble. Uh, all right. Let, I'm going to go on to the next verse then. And it is uh, verse 28, uh, the last verse of the 17th chapter. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. This is one of my all-time favorite verses in this whole book of Proverbs. Uh, brother, I'll ask you to explain that. I'll read it sl slowly, and then you explain it. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Oh, yes. Uh, we are in one accord, Brother Luke, because I myself have always loved that verse so much because oftentimes it has granted me that status of wisdom because I just kept my mouth shut. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Um, yeah, I, I think as we continue on in Proverbs, we're going to see the opposite principle in, um, uh, uh, put forth too. And that is that if people who are really anxious to talk a lot, I'll, I'll, instead of people thinking they're smart, or their their uh, ignorance is is exposed. Uh, and and this verse is telling us that hey, it's, it's it's far better just hold your tongue. You don't have to do a lot of talking. Sometimes people who, who are really silent all the time, and it seems like they're meditative, they're <laughs> they're uh, uh, contemplative, they're, and uh, they're uh, they must be very uh, knowledgeable and wise people because they're not. Uh, you know, speaking so much. And that's the perception people get. So instead of trying to convince people that you know so much, just keep your mouth shut. And then your chances are far better of people respecting you and thinking you're wise. Oh, that, that man is very wise. Uh, and all he did was he just sat there, said nothing and listened. <laughs> I'm going to look at the KJV's version of that, I mean the uh, Amplified's version of that now, it says, even a callous, arrogant fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's, he is regarded as sensible, prudent, discreet, and a man of understanding. <laughs> of everything in the book of Proverbs, this is probably the easiest thing to adopt as a, as a life principle. You just stop trying to speak so much and convince people you're knowledgeable and, and wise and just keep your mouth shut and people will think you're contemplative and prudent and wise. And so it's the easiest thing you can do, but for, for some people it's not maybe the hardest thing because it seemed like, uh, some, it's natural for a lot of people want to do all the talking and do very little listening. All right, so that's uh, that's chapter 20, I mean 17. We're going to move on to chapter 18 now. And I'll look at it first in the KJV. Uh, oops, where is it? Proverbs Amplified. Yeah, okay. Chapter 18, verse 1. Through, through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. That's kind of a Rubik's Cube to figure that out here because of the all the words that, uh, especially intermeddleth. Uh, through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Uh, I, I, that basically sounds like Latin to me or Greek. It's not English. Brother, what do you think? Well, let me help clear it up for you, Brother Luke. Seeketh and meddleth, intermeddleth, would be to uh, just pretty much... Uh, meditate and uh 
figure out and seek out. The real mystery here in this verse is having separated himself. What does that mean, having separated himself? Well, to me, that means he put everything aside and focused on one thing, and that was to learn wisdom. you're i think you're right uh you're on the right track here um i'm gonna see if the amplified agrees with you i expect it probably will it says he who willfully separates himself from god and man seeks his own desire he quarrels against all sound wisdom wow that's saying the exact opposite is what what we thought I told I admitted I didn't understand it it sounded totally foreign to me and the amplified interprets it as a negative thing and rather than a positive thing so let me read it again uh, he who willfully separates himself from God and man seeks his own desire and you know what that is that that's pretty much uh, all of mankind until we learn that it's a mistake and we need to seek God uh, but until we until we learn our need for God specifically Jesus Christ our Savior God uh, until that time comes this is the state of a typical person they're just uh, uh, they're they're not even interested in God and, and sometimes not even interested in other people they're only seeking their own desires and, and then the end of it says he quarrels against all sound wisdom. Um, okay, brother, are you surprised by that? Thank you very much for uh, exposing me as a fraud. <laughs> now listen up here. I repent of my misunderstanding. That one word threw me for a loop, intermeddle it. And it just so happens... I should have known what that meant because uh, it's used many times uh, in pro and so I repent of having believed falsely what that verse was trying to say and I hope everyone who uh, comes across uh, that particular uh, situation in their own lives where they find that they have believed in something that wasn't true that they will repent and believe the truth okay back to you brother Luke Yes. Well, that's uh, that's another example of what I've said, that you are a humble man. And uh, um, you uh, if you do make a mistake you'll, and, and it's shown that you're, it's a mistake, that you're willing to admit it and say, hey, I'm, I was wrong. And uh, that's a quality that is very admirable and, and rare. So many people cannot admit they're wrong and repent. And you repent means... I, I changed my mind. I admit it, I was wrong, and now I, I saw it one way. Now I see it a new a new way. So let's go on to now the uh, uh, verse two, uh, chapter eighteen, verse two. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Uh, this is talking about that same person, you know, as verse 1. Verse 1 and verse 2 is, it's really talking about that person that is not concerned about it, God or anybody else, just just his own, uh, uh, his, his own desires. A fool that hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. All right, brother, what, you, what do you have to say about that? Well, Brother Luke, I've always understood that to mean that uh, 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 in a previous proverb, it stated that to seek one's own glory too much is not a good thing. And I think that's uh, uh, striking the same uh, theme here. Uh, I can remember in my youth uh, when I first came to know the Lord and his love was so great inside of me. I just thought, wow, this is awesome. Uh, God must have planned something great for me. And I would w wonder what it was. And I think, okay, well, maybe that's just 
And then it occurred to me uh, that, well, you know, see, well, the verse pointed out to me in Proverbs that that is not, uh, seeking one's own glory is not good. Oh, I don't know that reference, but I'm sure Bill would know it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's easy uh, to think of Brother Bill at times like this. We always miss him when he's not able to be with us. Uh, I, I recall from his uh, message yesterday, we did a, uh, a hangout together, and he was uh, had a date with his wife this evening. So right now, it's 1.30 p.m. in Las Vegas, but in England, it's where he is, it's 9.30 p.m., so he promised to take his wife out for chicken wings tonight, probably going out to a pub for some some beer and, and chicken wings. So I hope they're having a good time. But, you know, if he's here, he's a, just another great source of, of knowledge that's very helpful. We always miss him when he's not available. Um, now, let, let's look at that in the um, – I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, uh, verse, uh, verse 2, chapter 18. A closed-minded fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his personal opinions, unwittingly displaying his self-indulgence and his stupidity. <laughs> Boy, they, they took no prisoners there, did they? <laughs> That's very interesting that uh, the Amplified version appears to be very colorful today uh yeah it's uh colorful and illuminating uh all right so let's go i mean that, that you don't need to add anything to that it's just it, what could, nothing could be more clear than that so i what we're trying to learn from this is is let's apply these principles uh, it says a closed-minded fool does not delight in understanding so don't be a fool that does not delight in understanding. I mean, uh, to learn things, to understand things, to gain knowledge and wisdom. This should be something that you, you desire, that, that just delights you, you makes you give you joy. And um, I, I've reached that point in my life. I remember when I was going to school, um, you know, elementary school and high school and all through college, you know, I, I studied because uh, I had to. I did the bare minimum so that I could get by, and I, I progressed, and I graduated. And But um, I didn't delight in in uh, understanding and delight in, in learning things. You know, it's only after I finished college and went on, and then I started studying subjects independently that I actually had an interest in. And, of course, the, the primary subject I've been studying for the last 29 years that it called – greatest interest to me is the Bible theology and um, uh, I delight in it so you, you if you can delight in learning that, that's a wonderful thing and if you do not delight in learning this here says that that's foolishness you're a fool if you do not desire to learn it says but only in revealing his personal opinions I mean instead of someone uh, who uh, being someone that doesn't w want to learn anything new by listening to other people you, this person says, you're only revealing your personal opinions, unwittingly displaying your, your self-indulgence and your stupidity. Uh, I hope you're not like that. I hope if you are like that, that you uh, will um, recognize this quality in yourself that is a bad quality and go about to change it. And, uh, you know, we can always try to make changes in our lives through our own human efforts. But the best way to change is to believe on Jesus Christ. That way you, you're guaranteed that you're going to go to heaven. And you also, uh, by believing in Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And the Holy Spirit of God will transform you and change your desires so that your desires are good desires, righteous desires, rather than the old desires that we, we had, uh, you know, that were very worldly and, and self-absorbed desires. Um, okay, brother, before I go on, uh, any last word on that? Amen, brother Luke, because it's God that works in us to will and to do 
his good pleasure. Uh, reference uh, needed. Uh, mental note to Bill. Okay. Okay, now we'll go on to, uh, this will be verse uh, 3. I'll look at it in the KJV first. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. <laughs> oh, God. If Jack Smack was here, he'd know what ignominy is. Uh, I don't know what that word is, ignominy at all. But uh, when the uh, one more time, and then I'll let you take a stab at explaining it to me. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. Okay, Brother Luke. Uh, with a word that sounds like ignominy, you know it's got to be bad. Okay. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I'm pretty sure that this is a bad thing we're talking about here. So I'm going to look at it, verse 3 here in the Amplified. And it says, When the wicked man comes to the depth of evil, contempt of all that is pure and good also comes, uh, and with inner baseness, dishonor comes outer shame. Let me see that in the AMP KJV again here. Wow. That's what all that means. Huh? So see, the KJV has maybe 10 words, and the Amplified has probably 30 words or 40 words explaining this here. So I'm going to read the KJV first and then the other one so we can um, try to get the, the gist of this finally here. KJV, when the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. All right, I, I couldn't begin to explain that, so we go to the Amplified, and it, it, it takes a lot more words to explain this. When the wicked man comes to the depth of evil, contempt of all that is pure and good also comes. And with inner baseness, dishonor comes outer shame, scorn. Yes, I had to look that word up in Google, and it does mean uh, shame and disgrace, ignominy. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Well, we learned a new word, but I don't know if I'm going to remember it very long. Ignominy, shame and disgrace. Um, so, this kind of person, obviously, uh, we would want to avoid them if they come into your circle. Uh, you certainly don't want to be around that person unless it is just enough time to tell them the good news and, and hopefully that they'll, it's, I find it very unlikely that they'll receive it. But sometimes you're surprised. Sometimes the most unlikely person, when they hear the good news, they receive it with joy. And, and uh, there, there's a great transformation that takes place. So uh, I would say that this kind of a person, when we encounter them, let's tell them about Jesus and hopefully, prayerfully, that they'll believe and be changed and will not be this evil, contemptuous person any longer. Uh, if they if they do continue on that, then obviously that's someone that we do not want to be associated with. Okay, I'm gonna look at this. Uh, uh, KJV verse four. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. <coughs> All right, the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, um, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. I don't know what to make of that, brother. I mean, I could throw in my own theories, but I would just be guessing. What do you think of that? 
Well, Brother Luke, it does remind me of uh, what Jesus said. He that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters and uh, wellsprings of wisdom. What is wellsprings of wisdom? That's something that we could probably contemplate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's... Uh, uh, Let's look at that in the Amplified. I'm, I, I'm hopeful that it will help us. Verse 4. Uh, the words of a man's mouth are like deep waters, copious and difficult to fathom. The fountain of mature godly wisdom is like a bubbling stream, sparkling, fresh, pure, and life-giving. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, it's it's saying that on one hand that the uh, the words of a people speak uh, sometimes it's just very difficult to understand, but but if they have wisdom, then uh, then uh, it, it's refreshing. It's like a bubbling stream. It's fresh, pure, and life giving. So that's another reason for us to die, desire and seek wisdom, because then when we speak, it will be beneficial to people instead of just confusing. Uh, I was talking about one of my friends. Uh, with I, I have some old college friends that I still close friends with that we still get together periodically and, and uh, you know, have a good time and golf together in it one of them though it just seemed like he's just hard to understand it's, it's like this this example here i mean he's saying things but it sounds like he's still on lsd like 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 we were back in the 60s and 70s <laughs> you know, he's just, I, I, it's, and, and it's uh, i don't know I just, you just have and it's not just me but Everybody that knows him, it just seemed like he's, he's saying all kinds of gobbledygook all the time. And it's supposed to be really philosophical the way it's it's supposed to, to be. But and yet it's just nothing but but uh, gobbledygook. And and it, but if you have wisdom, then what you're going to say should not be difficult to understand. It should be pure and refreshing, life giving. I'll move on, brother. Anything else on that? um that uh sounds good to me okay back to you all right okay let's go kjv verse five it is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment uh, and I think that's pretty simple. I think it means just don't side with a wicked person to overthrow a good person. Um, brother, do you do you think it's that clear or anything else you want to add to that? Uh, I'm not done meditating on that one yet, Brother Luke. Okay, I'll look at that in the Amplified, verse 5. Uh it says, to show respect to the wicked person is not good, nor to push aside and deprive the righteous of judgment, of justice. Yeah, I, I, yeah to, to, to me, it's just basically saying, don't side with the bad person, take the side of the good person. Uh, if, there, if there is a, uh, a cause, and you can see that the, on one side that it's bad, on the other side is a good cause, join the good cause. Don't, don't support the bad one, the bad people. Uh, anything else further on that before I go on? Well, Brother Luke, uh, oddly enough, uh, we've had a string of verses that are denouncing uh, particular behaviors, uh, which behaviors were in previous chapters uh, regarded as abominations to the Lord. And it's a little bit puzzling to me why uh, they are uh, lightly denouncing them as not good. When previously they were denouncing them as abominations. Yeah, 
Yeah, abomination is uh, means hated. If something is abominable, abominable, it means you 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 hate it. If you abominate it, and uh, so you're right. It, it, there's stronger language we found in, uh, in the last chapter than we're seeing now, but still, uh, it's still drawing a line, a distinction between these two qualities. One is good, the other is bad. Uh, let's go on to the next verse here in the KJV. Uh, verse 6, a fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, brother, why don't you explain that one to me? Well, um, it's no secret how uh, saying the wrong thing can be very troublesome for your se uh, person uh, uh, and how uh, one's mouth can really get them in trouble. Okay. The, the thing that uh, confuses me is the strokes. Um, um, I don't know if that's some kind of like a, a whip or not, but let me look at verse 6 in the Amplified. A fool's lips bring contention and strife, and his mouth invites a beating. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've had many occasions where I felt like giving someone a beating, and I've always, no, I've always restrained myself except for one time. I mean, I, I've, I've had, I've given up some beatings, but normally it was in self-defense. And one time, it was not in a question of self-defense. It was just a question of payback. And, and uh, you know, but, but th there's only a few cases in my life. And overall, there, I can think of a hundred times where I felt like I ought to give someone a beating, but I restrained myself. Particularly after I've gotten saved, I've done everything I can to have control and not lash out violently just because someone says something I don't like or does something I don't like is lied to me or cheated me in some way and uh, so it says here that uh, about the getting strokes or getting a beating um, it probably is justified here um, a fool's lips bring contention and strife well, you know people who are saying bad things cause contention and strife and and and, and it invites a beating it, 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 it's basically asking for it. Like, remember that saying, uh, uh, something bad happened to someone, like they, someone beat him up or something, and then we say, we say, well, he asked for it. You know, he asked for it. In other words, he deserved it because of what he did. He was like asking for, for it, you know. Uh, and that's, that's what this verse here reminds me of when it says he invites a beating. Brother? Uh, yes, and we've seen that scenario played out all across the bars of America, haven't we? Uh, at this very moment, somewhere, this verse is playing out right now, I'm sure, all over the world, where someone is being foolish, belligerent, causing trouble, and then they end up getting a beating over it. <laughs> it's like they, they asked for it. Uh, it's not that I, uh, who is has the Holy Spirit living inside me, wants to be the one that gives him the beating. I want to restrain myself and not give him the beating. But m most of the world, their answer to this fool is, is they deserve a beating. Okay, let's look at now the, the next verse in the KJV. It says, uh, verse 7, a fool's mouth 
is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul and this is uh the, these several verses here in a row are talking about people who are saying bad stupid things and getting into trouble for it uh, but verse seven what's your explanation of that a fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul well i think it just continues to uh impress upon us how important it is uh not to say uh stuff that's going to get you in trouble uh yeah it's uh, uh i guess we all do it at some point in our life it seems to be more calm and more frequent with a particular individuals some people seem to be more foolish i was watching this uh TV show that was an award-winning show maybe 10, 8 or 10 years ago called The Wire. And uh, there's a character in there, and he goes by the nickname of Ziggy. And this guy, I was told my son, this guy is the stupidest person in the history of all television. He's always mouthing off, and he's always getting a beating and, and trouble, serious trouble, because he can't keep his mouth shut saying stupid things that's an extreme example we've probably all done it to a certain extent but it's a it's an it's a sign of um it's a kind of a uh, scale of, of of wisdom the more we mouth off like that the fool, more foolish we were showing to ourselves to be the more we restrain ourselves and don't mouth off as I said in the first verse, you know, if you just keep your mouth shut, not only are you not going to get into trouble, but people might even think you're smart. He's very contemplative and prudent. He's not even talking. So. <laughs> All right, brother, I'll go on to the next verse. What, unless you want to say something more about that. Uh, no, go ahead, brother Luke. I'm going to play the silent card. <laughs> oh, man, brother, you are a quick learner, aren't you? Uh, uh, verse 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Wow. Okay, I'll let you take first shot at that one. The words of a talebearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Well, we know uh, how... Uh terrible the consequences of lying can be um happens all the time uh people lie uh and other people get in trouble for it good decent people uh are damaged and hurt because of it if you are the victim of someone who's a tail bearer who's making up lies about you and the, those lies end up wounding you, hurting you in some way. Uh, it's uh, I, I feel for you. I mean, I I've, I know I've been the victim of it, and I pray that I'm never guilty of causing that that pain in someone else because of you know making up stories about them, lying about them. I really, honestly, can't recall doing that at all. Maybe I'm, maybe I've done it and I'm just, you know, kind of cast it out of my memory. I don't know, but I don't think I've done that. I would, I'd barely be ashamed of myself if I made up lies about someone and stirred up trouble against them just to, to hurt them. Uh, but so if you, if that's happened to you, and I'm sorry for you, you know, I, and if you're the one that's caught doing that kind of thing, then it's, it's a shameful thing to do. We, we hope that you will repent, that you will see that the error of your your ways and, and the change and no longer hurt people by making up stories about them. I, I know that here on YouTube, I've suffered from that uh, from a, a handful of people. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified before we move on. Verse 8. The words of a whisperer uh, gossiping are like dainty morsels to be greedily eaten. 
They go down in the innermost chambers of the body to be remembered and mused upon. So it, it does agree that it's um, it's about gossiping. Okay, let's go back to the KJV, the verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. All right, brother, you know what that means? Uh, well, we know how terrible laziness is. And this verse is uh, pointing out that uh, wastefulness is just as bad. Okay. Uh, I would say that slothfulness, which is laziness, is a form of wastefulness because you're wasting away your talents in your life by being lazy. Uh, let's see what the Amplified, how it phrases it. Verse 9. He who is careless in his work is a brother to him who destroys. All right, that's not very complicated, but... Uh, you know, these are things that we hopefully will all learn to adopt these good qualities in our lives and espunge the bad qualities. Uh, and through our own efforts, it's going to probably be impossible. So um, embrace Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will transform you so that you adopt the good qualities and the, the good qualities are, are espunged. Uh, let's go to verse 10 in the KJV. Uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. That's a beautiful verse, brother. What do you say about that? Well, you know, I was thinking, Brother Luke, uh, I wish Bill was here to comment on that one. <laughs> I am. It's certainly clear that you love and and, and uh, admire, respect Brother Bill as I do, and he's always sorely missed when he's not available. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear his comments on that and all of it. Um, I'm going to look at this in the uh, Amplified, uh, verse ten. Uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and, and the righteous runs it to it, and is safe, and set on high wall, on set on high, far above evil. Uh, well, what is the name of the Lord? Uh, there was a time, be, be, in, in what we commonly call the Old Testament. Um, where the name of the Lord uh, was not fully known. Uh, there, are, in fact, the name could, was not even supposed to be written because in Judaism, the name uh, of God is, is, is so revered, they say you cannot even spell it out. You have to just use, uh, I, had a, I had a banner once when I was street preaching and it had the, G, the word G-O-D in it. And a Jewish person came up and rebuked me, saying, "You should not. You should have G space D. Never say uh, uh, spell out the entire name of God. That's how in Judaism they respected the name of God or the word, even the word God. Uh, and yet the name is is not clearly stated in the Old Testament. Now in in some Bibles they." They will call him Yahweh, or they will call him uh, Je Jehovah. Um, but that, that's just man's attempt to try to put the, the letters together. And I'm not going to go into how they arrived at those ways of pronouncing it. Um, but, but today we do know his name very, very clearly. In fact, the scripture tells us there is a name above all names. And and. Uh, and and this, this name is Jesus. And the word Jesus, 
um, it literally translates to God saves. So the name Jesus is a description of who he is and what he does. He is God who saves. And uh, the, the scripture says there's salvation in his name. Uh, and it says there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. So the name of God is this tower and, and, and his name is Jesus. And when we put our faith in him and his name and put it, uh, it, it's like entering into this tower and we're safe. We're, we don't have to worry about the judgment in hell because we're in the tower, which is Jesus. Uh, brother, any, you want to expound on that any further? Oh, that was great, Brother Luke. Uh, let's leave it at that. All right, let's, uh, let's go on to the next verse in the KJV. Uh, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. And as a high wall in his own conceit. Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. Well, some of you watching this, uh, you might be surprised at how often I am confounded by a verse, particularly when I read it in the KJV, because it just seems like, and, and, and I, I'm going to boast for just a moment here. I'm, I am an educated person. I'm not someone that just made it through the fifth or sixth grade. You know, I, I've gone all the way through college and I graduated and I've, I've studied for years after college. And I, I have a pretty good vocabulary. And yet, as I read the KJV, look at all the verses that just confound me because of the way it's written. Now, this is another reason why I'm not a KJV onlyist, because if, if I left it at that and said, I'm not going to look at the Amplified or other translations or the Greek or, or, or look at commentators, what they've written about the verse. If, if I would limit myself strictly to the KJV, I will look at all the verses that I would be lost because I just don't understand it. And it's written in ancient, ancient English. And it's, it seems to me it's like Greek or Latin sometimes. I just don't understand it. I'm going to look at the Amplified, but before I do, I'll ask Brother Eric to comment on the verse and, and, my, and my also comment on my comment. Well, Brother Luke, um, I've always uh, naturally took to the Old English for some reason. Uh, it's always been uh, uh, understandable to me, except in a few instances uh, where I misunderstood a word uh, like we uh, seen earlier today. Uh, but uh, today uh, is a very special day, Brother Luke. This verse has shown me the connection between the love of money and pride. And I've been searching high and low for it, and now I've found it in scriptures. So it is a hallmark day for me, and I'm going to mark it on my uh, calendar. Back to you, Brother Luke. All right. Well, I'm, uh, I admitted that I'm lost on this verse, and then you uh, explain it in that way. How, how do you translate it into the to get that out of it. Okay, Brother Luke, let me go over it real quick. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Okay, that's his love for money. And as in high wall, in his own conceit, there's his pride. And there's the connection from the root of e the love of money, the root of all evil, to the trunk pride. There's the connection according to scriptures. Uh, yeah, it makes sense as you explained it and, and uh, read it. I, I think you, you may be right on that. I'll, I'm going to get the second opinion from the Amplified. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it agrees with you. Um, in verse 11, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall of protection in his own imagination and conceit. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can see it now with with the amplified and your commentary on it. Yeah, I I can see that now. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm, there are. It it, it seems like. Uh, Well, Jesus talked about the, the rich young ruler and how uh, his regarding his conversation with the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler walked away, you know, distraught because uh, Jesus, Jesus said to him, OK, you say that you've followed all the commandments since your youth. If you really want to prove how that you're worthy then sell everything you own and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And Jesus knew that the rich young ruler hadn't really followed all the commandments. The, 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 what the rich young ruler had done is he, he, he suffered from what we call easy legalism. That means that a person who says that they don't sin, they have to believe in sinless perfection or they believe in lordship salvation and they think that they are they're doing it all right and they're they're doing well enough that what they've done is they've watered down the law and jesus instead of watering down the law he built it up to such a high wall that you could never get over it. he said not only is it a sin to commit adultery but even if you think about it you've already sinned not only is it a sin to commit murder, if you even hate someone, you've already murdered them in your mind and in your heart. So he built a wall even higher. So you see, I'm, it's impossible. And that's why he, he knew that the rich young ruler was not nearly as good as he thought. And he certainly wasn't good enough to be, get into heaven on personal merit because he didn't have to be perfect. And so he said, it's easier for Jesus said to his apostles after the rich young ruler was gone, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. And his apostles were shocked because they thought that if someone was rich, that was an indication that they were done. They had done well because they thought that riches was a result of living, being doing good. And when you, if you did all the right things, you'll be blessed and you'll become rich. Uh, but that's not always, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and certainly, uh, even if you do get rich and you, because you had done good, well, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. And so Jesus was showing them, wait a second, not only do you have to uh, do the best you can at following the commandments, but even if you do the best you can, you're gonna fall short because you, the standard is perfection. And so he said, it's impossible. And then his apostles asked him one of the greatest questions ever asked. They said, Jesus, well, if that's the case, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? Isn't that a wonderful question? How is it possible for anyone to get saved? If you can't get, if you're telling us that uh, uh, it's, so it's hard for a rich man, it's like going through the camel through, through the eye of a needle. Then Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. That's what we want everybody to understand today. And that's the message we have for in, in every one of our, our Bible studies is you've got to understand it is impossible for you to get to heaven through personal merit. But then Jesus said, but with God, all things are possible. So you can't do it on your own, but with God, if you'll trust God, then it's possible and jesus is our savior god so if you'll trust jesus it's possible it's not only possible but it's promised it's guaranteed so this this uh, relates to this whole idea about you know wealth and uh, uh people it's it's not that a rich person can't go to heaven that's not what jesus was saying but it seems like when people are rich what they've done for the most part, most of them, is they've forsaken everything else. They're not thinking about God. They're not thinking about family. They're not thinking about friendship. They're not thinking about ministry. They're not thinking about anything else except acquiring money. Because in order to get really rich, you have to become single-minded. Uh, 
record. That, that, that's not only true about money, but anything. If you wanted to be the world's greatest athlete, you'd have to take on the same kind of mindset. I'm going to forsake everything else, and I'm going to focus like a laser beam on this one thing. If you want to become the world's greatest preacher, you have to be, become single-minded too. And you forsake your family, your health, your community, everything else. All you're doing is focusing on this one thing. And so that's whether it's money or anything else, we, we need to understand that uh, we, we don't want to neglect God and family and our health and our lives and everything else. There must be a balance in life. Uh, so that's the problem with rich people. It's not that it's a sin to be rich. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to be rich. But most people, in order to achieve riches, they neglect everything else and get so single-minded that that pursuit of money becomes like God to them. That's what they're worshiping. Their heart and their mind is on that one thing. All right, brother, maybe I went off a little bit too much on a tangent, but let me ask your comments on all that. Well, that was excellent, Brother Luke. I love that. Uh, good job. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to go on to the next verse, and it's... Uh, verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Oh, that's beautiful. I think I can understand that right off the bat. But let me ask you to comment on that, brother. Verse 12. I would have to Google that word haughty. Oh. Haughty means that uh, you're like full of pride. Okay. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, it's talking about the difference between... Am I... I didn't know if I was muted. Um, it's talking about the difference between pride and humility. You know, if you have pride, you're going to uh, you know, end up being destroyed. Your pride will destroy you. Uh, and if you have humility, uh, you'll end up being honored. Like, example, today's brother Eric, you know, he showed a lot of humility. And, 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 and therefore, people are going to respect that and I'll, I'll honor it. If he came out as pride, proud and boastful, you know, eventually he's, is this going to be destroyed because uh, uh, everybody can see that in him and it, it'll stand out like a sore thumb. Like there, there's a lot of people today that uh, famous people that are so full of pride and arrogance that it's, it's obvious to everyone. Uh, I'll look at that in the Amplified and then we'll uh, let me see. Before disaster, the heart of a man is haughty and filled with self-importance, but humility comes before honor. All right, it's pretty self-explanatory. But uh, again, what we're learning from this is let's not just read it and understand it. Let's apply it. And again, if you try to apply this through your own power, you know, you may have some modicum of success, uh, but um, it's just like salvation. To, to try to achieve salvation through your own effort, you only have a modicum of success. You're, you're going to fall short of what's needed. So whether it's getting saved or living a life that has wisdom and understanding and all these things that we want, uh, if you're trying to attain that through your own efforts, uh, you're only going to go so far. The best thing you can do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, gain salvation, gain the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will transform you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can, we can, we can gain, we can attain all of these attributes, these wonderful attributes that we're discussing in the book of Proverbs. Okay. Before I go on, brother, anything else? Oh, that's wonderful, Brother Luke. And it also reminds me of the words of Jesus when he spoke to the Pharisees and he told them that they strain at a net, but they swallow a camel. All right, I'll move on to the uh, 
Next verse in the KJV. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, this verse here. This rings so true with me, uh, with the problem I've had here on YouTube dealing with some people. It says, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it is a folly and shame unto him. Uh, go ahead and explain that to me, brother. I, 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 this, this verse is very dear to me. Okay, Brother Luke. Well, this is often painful for me uh, uh, whenever I'm walking in the flesh and not in the spirit because uh, I have a propensity for this uh, malady myself. Okay, back to you. Yeah, um, I've I've been arguing quite a while about um, people who are unwilling to listen to the other side of an argument. I made a video titled "Arguing is Good." Now, I hope you all go watch that video. But to sum it up, is that I'm not talking about heated arguments where there's emotion and anger and uh, name calling and that kind of a thing. That's not good. I'm talking about uh, if you disagree on a, a subject, let's say we ask you a theological question and, and, and you give an answer and then someone else says you're wrong and this is how I see it. Two parties should be able to take turns talking and listening and through back and forth discourse if they're going to be fair if they're going to give the other side a fair hearing and actually listen to them and consider their point of view uh, that's what is a healthy type of an argument a discourse that can be profitable because I've had these kinds of arguments over the years that have been very beneficial I've had some people where we've been respectful and courteous to each other, exchanging our ideas, disagreeing, but being willing and able to listen. And then on some occasions, I've won them over to my side. On other occasions, they've won me over to their side, and I've changed my position. Sometimes nobody is persuaded, but both sides gained because at least we understand each other's arguments better. And that's what uh, is desirable. And here uh, in this verse 13 is the big problem that prevents that kind of um, thing from good thing from happening is that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it. Will you give the other person a fair hearing? Will you give me a fair hearing? If I come up with some theological point of view that you disagree with, are you just going to go, na, 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 and tune me out and don't want to hear it? Have a knee-jerk reaction where you immediately get angry and start saying heretic? Or are you going to answer before you hear the whole thing out? If you would give a fair hearing and hear the whole argument out and be fair, you might find out that maybe you're wrong. But there's a saying that, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Now, if I'm in error on something, I don't want to hold on to my error. If I'm wrong, I want someone to tell me. And I want to listen and be fair. Now, if you tell me I'm wrong and you explain why, I might not be persuaded. You might not persuade me. Maybe I'll still continue believing that, no, I'm right and you're wrong. But the only thing I have to lose by listening to you and being fair is the error that I'm holding. That's what the only thing I have to lose. And it, it, this, the quote goes on to say, uh, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed? Well, I'm not a stubborn fool in that respect. If you can expose my error and uh, prove me wrong, I'm going to listen. And if, if I'm wrong, I'm not going to hold on to my error. I'm going to say, oh, no, you won me over. 
It has happened numerous times on various theological questions. And that's what I love about this verse. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So shame on you, and it is foolish on your part to just give answers and you don't even listen to the person. You tune them out and won't even consider their point of view. Uh, all right, brother, uh, that's I, it's kind of a tirade, a diatribe <laughs> that I just went on. But what's your viewpoint of all that? Very good, Brother Luke, and it's all very, very important, too, because uh, scriptures demand uh, that we do hear others out, and love demands it, and to do otherwise, uh, you do so at your own peril, and that peril could mean your own eternal destination your own eternal happiness okay back to you brother Luke. okay enough said on that verse we'll go on now to the um, I'd like to read that verse uh, in the amplified I didn't look at an amplified see what it says about it <laughs> he who answers before you before he hears the facts it is folly and shame to him. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Uh, now go to verse 14 in the KJV. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? All right, I'll let you I'll let you explain that to me, brother. Well, Brother Luke, uh, we've had a string of tough ones today, haven't we? I don't know if I can explain this one right offhand. I would have to meditate on it first. All right. Uh, I'm going to read it one more time in the KJV, and then I'll move, move the Amplified. Uh, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. And uh, I think that's talking about our attitude. Uh, if you have a positive attitude, uh, you're probably going to deal better with your infirmity, uh, your health problems, for example, if you have a positive attitude, or if you have any problem in your life, if you have a positive attitude, you're going to deal with it better than if you have a negative attitude. And, and, and a wounded spirit is someone who's like dejected and given up and has a negative attitude. Uh, that Who can bear it? Well, that'll just cause depression and and who knows, who knows what that would lead to. Uh, I think that's what it's referring to, but let's look at it in the Amplified. The spirit of a man sustains him in sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? It doesn't elaborate too much more. I, uh, what, Brother, what do you think of the uh, answer I gave on that? Brother Luke, uh, it appears that the Amplified Version backs up completely, 100%, what you stated uh, about that. And that was uh, uh, very uh, revealing and uh, uh, blessed. Blessed. I'm very blessed to uh, know that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, last thing I'll say on this is that if, if you're sick, um, besides getting good health care, oh, two good two, two simple things you can do to help is have a positive attitude, have faith, and and also get a get a dog, get a little pet. <laughs> if you if you have a pet, it's good for your health. All right, uh, now I'll go on to the uh, the next verse. This is verse. Uh, 15 the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge all right brother what do you say okay the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge 
Of course. Chain reaction. It is what it is. Okay. Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, I don't know if that requires any explanation, but we'll read in the Amplified, see if it simplifies it any bit at all. That says, the mind of the prudent always acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise always seeks knowledge. Okay. That's in line of thinking that of everything we've been talking about. It's wise to be open and want to learn. Uh, let's go on to the next verse in the KJV. Verse 16, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Wow, this could be a tricky one. Could be positive or it could be a, a little tricky one like uh, uh i'm not going to say the word i'm thinking of because i want to give you first chance at it verse 16 brother okay brother look um, i've always loved this verse uh, because it always uh reminded me of me and my job and how i had a, a good trade a good skill and i could always get a good job and I would be thankful to the Lord for that. And uh, this verse was the uh, talisman for that uh, thinking. Do you remember how in previous chapters, and we've, we've talked about the word gift and being, and being in, uh, translated as bribe. Uh, that's why I was worried that this may be referencing a bribe here, but we'll see what the Amplified and how, what they say about it. Uh, uh, a man's gift given in love and or courtesy makes room for him and brings him uh, and brings him before great men. Okay. They don't interpret it as a bribe. Um, Um, that's verse 16. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is uh, I'm going to have to cut it off here at verse 16 because uh, something I have to do so we won't be able to take the full two hours. Um, we'll pick up with verse 17. Let me make a note here. Proverbs 8, Proverbs 18, verse 17. I think that's where we are, right? Next. Verse, verse 17, yeah. Proverbs 18, verse 17. That's where we'll pick up next time. Let's finish, though, with an invitation to receive the, the uh, free gift of salvation. Um, I mean, to me... Uh, it would be very shameful, uh, you know, a, a shame if someone listened to this study today and started acquiring basic knowledge about life and how to get, gain wisdom, and yet they walked away only with that, and they never received wisdom unto salvation. The most wise thing a person can do is receive the free gift of salvation. So I would uh, ask you, brother, or just in, 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 as concisely as you can, uh, if someone says right now, salvation, yeah, I, I, that means going to heaven, right? Uh, I want to go to heaven. Now, I, I, I've asked a lot of people this question over the years. Do you want to go to heaven? <laughs> and, you know, I've been amazed. Some people tell me, no, I don't want to go to heaven. It's because they either, either don't really believe in, in there's a heaven and a hell. I don't really believe it's real. Or they're so bitter and cynical and, and they say they, they'd rather be in hell because that's where their friends are going to be. And they think hell is a good, better than heaven. And I tell them, well, I got news for you. The, the party in hell was canceled due to the fire. There's no party there. <laughs> uh, but let's assume for a second that someone watching now says, yes, yes, this, I do want to go to heaven. But they don't know how to get there. They don't know what they must do. 
So if someone is sincere right now and really wants to go to heaven, would you tell them what they must do so that they can go to heaven, so that they will go to heaven, and so that it's certain? Yeah. Well, Brother Luke, uh, it's very important to uh, adhere to the proper interpretation of scriptures and uh, the great mystery of salvation, which uh, all the people in the Old Testament it was just a mystery to them. They had no clue what it was about, uh, except for a few of them who had a premonition of it. And it's no longer a mystery now. According to scriptures, Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross and shed his blood. And he was buried and rose again the third day, according to scriptures. And for that, we receive... We receive his sacrifice by believing on him who only could save us. He alone was worthy, scriptures say. And he, upon believing on him, he will give you new life. And you will know it's true. And scriptures back it up. And this new life can never be erased. This new life is free. And with it you receive forgiveness and freedom and fearlessness and health and peace. And the new man inside you is even sinless and perfect. And soon your flesh will follow in the resurrection. All by opening the door and letting him in and communing with him believe his promises he promises it to you it's it's in scriptures it uh john three sixteen. god loves you he gave his son to die for you to have eternal life so that you won't be condemned because all creation is condemned uh okay back to you brother luke <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, brother. I'm I'm going to post uh, as I do on all my videos um, in the description section on this uh, study, in this video. Uh, I'll be posting um, a statement of faith, the basic principles or doctrines that I believe that are essential, and and then also posting some scripture verses that will explain to you and support. Uh, the, the basic ideas I'm going to tell you right now, a couple of basic things. One is that you probably think you can go to heaven if you work your way there, if by earning it, if you're a good person. That's wrong. The Bible says you can't get to heaven through personal merit. So it, that's the first thing you need to understand. Second thing you need to understand is that God loves you so so much that he, he said, I, they, they can't do it. I'm going to do it for them. Um, they can't be perfect, and that's what's required. So I'll become a man, and he did. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'll, and I'll die on a cross and pay for all their sins. And then sin will not be a barrier. See, God could not be with man because sin was a barrier. So God said, this is the problem. I need to solve the sin problem. So he became a man and he died on a cross and he paid for all our sins. Now there's no barrier. You're free to come to God, Jesus Christ, the Savior God. You're free to come to him and embrace him as your Savior because he paid for your sins. There's no barrier. Uh, and when you do that, when you put your faith in Jesus, he promises you a resurrection, a, a life after death in heaven forever. And he, he, he proved he has the power to do that because he raised himself from the dead. After he died, after three days in the, in the tomb, he raised himself from the dead. And he said the reason he did that was so that he uh, he gave us a sign as proof that he is God and Savior. He has the power over life and death. So simply what we're just asking you to do now is, is acknowledge 
that you cannot get to heaven through your own effort. And, and therefore, you need to be saved. You need, you need an intervention from God. You're helpless and need God to solve the problem. And the only one that can solve that problem is Jesus. He's our Savior God. He's the only way. So you put your faith in Jesus, and then you're guaranteed eternal life in heaven. No longer believe in your own ability to get to heaven. Instead, believe in Jesus' ability to get you there. I believe that he's able to give you eternal life and believe he's faithful. He's promising it. He's guaranteeing it. Believe he's a man of his word. The Bible says uh, God cannot lie and he cannot break a promise. So Jesus is promising you eternal life in heaven if you'll trust him. So don't trust yourself anymore. Don't trust the religions of the world. Instead, trust Jesus. And you're guaranteed eternal life in heaven if you'll do that. All right. I, I hope you will put your faith in Jesus today and then make a comment on this video so that we know about it. I'd love to celebrate for you. Uh, okay. Uh, join us every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time as we continue these studies. Uh, and br Brother Eric, uh, I'll let you say good goodbye to everybody and then we'll end the show. Thank you, Brother Luke, for having me. And thank you, viewers, for watching. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Okay. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>